of a nation. We're all for healthy living. We're all for chasing dreams. For debt and spandex superheroes aren't what our kids need. There was a yellow ring for Royal Bank and one red ring for Coke. One ring for the green wash. It's all a bit of a joke. Two for misspent time and money. Black and blue for all. Bank and one red ring for coke, one ring for the green wash. It's all a bit of a joke. Two for misspent time and money, but I can do for all. There's no gold. For the kid with a ball.
at me Threatening winter as I walk Summer always goes so quick Belly stopping like my thoughts Just dip and spin and change so fast I have to wonder Sadness creeps into my dreams When you're scared of living But afraid to die I get scared of giving And I must find my faith to beat it Yeah Rushing by Time just lingers on the wind Listen to my open fears I wonder what it's gonna bring All about the clouds What's to be found I have to wonder Catch the sail at evening's tide 
walk in and out of the sauna. It sounds like. Uh... Rick, can I hear your mic? Yes, here's my mic. Here's my level. This is the way I talk. Here's the mic. Level, level, level. Yeah, so so be nice and close to the mic okay. a little bit. Okay. Like Let's hear that again. Like this is good. This That's is, perfect. Is good. That's just perfect. So there you go. So there's the delay, Michelle. We're coming online now live. Can you turn your volume up over there? I think we're ready to go. Okay. Well, good evening, and thank you for joining us. We are here in the sound at the Art Center in Seashell for a live interactive Q&A with BC NDP, Powell River Sunshine Coast candidate, and three-time MLA, Nicholas Simons, going for his fourth consecutive term. And we are here with bunch of your questions that have been submitted. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can submit more as uh, over the next hour. Please feel free. Uh, we already have some, so we're going to start. Are you ready there? Yeah, yes. sure. Let's get out of there. So, Lila, this is not so much a question, but she says, uh, Nicholas, could you talk a bit about poverty? Yeah. And about the overdosing crisis. So I guess Lila sees the connection. Course we all could so yeah it's, it's an interesting question and uh, obviously the party the NDP has been trying for a long time to convince the government that we need more than just statements about platitudes about jobs and about the idea that there's no need for a poverty reduction strategy we strongly believe there's a need for a poverty re reduction strategy that has identified goals and objectives that we can measure um, and the poverty reduction strategy includes everything from you know, ensuring families have access to child care, uh, families have access to support services when uh, their relatives need care, um, all sorts of areas around housing, around affordability in general, which I think has been uh, a serious um, issue throughout this election campaign. And for the last 16 years, quite frankly, we've seen affordability become more and more challenging for families and individuals. So poverty reduction strategy is one of the commitments that I was happy to see in our, uh, in our platform. And specifically relating to the uh, opioid crisis, I don't believe that government has been strong enough. I think that uh, we, we need to really be looking at innovative solutions that are beyond um, what our government is contemplating, including replacement uh, therapies, including ensuring that we have properly regulated recovery housing, that we recognize that a majority of people who are in our prison system, which by the way costs us about $285 per night per individual, is not the most beneficial use of the public funding. So we have a lot of ways where that we can try to remedy some of that hollowing out of our social programs that have taken place over the last number of years. I mean, it's a steep hill to climb, but we, we have not been left in a position where our social service system has adequate elasticity or depth or, or uh, capacity to address the issue. So I hope that kind of wraps, that, that gives you an idea of the attitude and the approach of the new, of the new government. And we have a little sound issue, so if you just want to let people know that. Okay, we'll... we are having a, a, experiencing a few yep. uh, audio uh, problems, uh, but uh, our technician, Steve, is furiously working on right now, so I hope that's not too frustrating for you. Unplug that one, unplug that one. Just give me that one. Just give me a second. Don't worry. 
Sounds good over okay, here. So um, we talk frequently, Nicholas, about uh, 16 years of neglect, hollowing out of social programs. I mean, it really goes so deep and so broadly that, you know, it, it is hard to know where to start in terms of explaining what has to be done, what's possible to be done. I should, I should add, that not, not in addition, but if, if I may, one of the most significant proposals of the New Democratic Party, not a proposal, an assurance that the issue around addiction to mental health is so significant and so, uh, so lacking in uh, attention from the current government uh, that we've been left in a very difficult situation. As I said, one of the commitments is that we will establish a standalone ministry of mental health and addiction. And I was having lunch with my friends over at Arrowhead today, and I talked a lot about this because, you know, one of the things that we can commit to is that we'll be a more um, understanding government, one with a lot more compassion and recognition of the struggles that people face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think establishing a standalone, and I'm looking over at Reginald from Morocco, establishing a standalone uh, ministry would allow community members to know where to go for help, to know where to go for advice, and to, to know where to go for programs and services that need to be applied. And I think in our day and age, um, recognizing the breadth of mental health issues that we face in our community, recognizing that addictions impact so many families, that having a separate and standalone ministry would, would be a good, a good and important step towards addressing, addressing the issue. Steve's still working on some of the Steve's still working on the project. Yeah. Sure I, don't know I think you should, back. if you okay. could just pause for a sec because there's a delay on things. Okay. We are going to just take a moment. Yeah. Please do stay with us. Thank you. We're here with uh, CCNDP candidate Nicholas Simons on a live Q&A. And uh, it's live. So uh, live sometimes Perfect. presents problems and we've got a few at the moment. So stick with us. Thanks. Thank you. It's a good one, hey? There's a whole generation of it's, kids. It's a microphone now. So. Can we talk about the phone for a second, Nicholas? What's that? Talk through your microphone for a second. Okay, I'll just do the day of the week. We have seven sleeps until election 2017. We have tonight, tomorrow, up till Tuesday. So today is Tuesday, election's Tuesday. This is why we like a sound check. I, I can talk through this mic. I'd be happy to hold the mic. I'd be happy to uh, determine if you need a different sort of yeah. form. Yeah. I can give them the mic, but it's the same. It's the same line. It's not yeah. really oh, okay. Well, I don't know what happened this time because I can so there's a delay between audio and video. Is there a problem with the way that sounds? Yeah. Yeah. Sound yeah. 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 So can you turn on? We're just going to reset something. We're going to reset something. Right? <clears throat> reset something. Uh, as far as I'm Ghosts concerned, and machines. We have, uh, we, have, we have time. I Good. Folks out there have time. Uh, it's an important election. Many people have expressed their concern about another four years of our current government. And I've had, I think, with Tim and Matt, we've had eight all candidates meetings so far. And. Really, really interesting questions from people of all walks of life. And yesterday we had a really good inter. Uh, I had a nice time. So I met with the kids at Cedar Grove, uh, the grade sevens and the grade sevens. Uh, youngsters, students had really interesting questions. Everything from why does BC Ferry call some of these 13 and how? Is there anywhere else where um, students or ch children's fairs end at age 12? You know, I'm going to work on that because that, that's something that I've always wondered about. Families yeah, always too much. have a bit of a resentment when they see not only are parents super high, but they're also extra high for, for children. They're not, 
We apologize for the uh, audio difficulties. Um, oh, yes, maybe he is a busy candidate. We weren't here in time for a sound check. No, that's my fault. Um, there you go. Yeah, it's just the way it goes. Uh, it's not really anyone's fault. Anyhow, we uh, so please be patient with us. Uh, we hope that um, it's a little bit better now. Well, how, how's this? Does it sound a little bit better? There's a little delay, so we'll know in a second here. So just okay. sure, I'll just keep talking about the talk to me about the show. One of the questions last night, uh, or yesterday afternoon, was that from this thing that, 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 that Peter Grove was about to line up in that. I'm in with a, yes. a, 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 a trending hashtag on Twitter that uh, resulted from an interaction between a resident of Hopkins and the Premier of the province, who, in response to the resident of the Sunshine Coast, uh, kind of snubbed, snubbed her. And she said, I'm sorry, I can never, she didn't say the sun, she said, I could never vote for you. And the Premier just sort of said, well, that's why we need a democracy to walk away. She was her right, but it is yeah. truly a, uh, an indication, I think, of her attitude, unfortunately, towards many in our community who have felt unheard. And so people felt a uh, connection to Linda, hashtag I am Linda. Because she was treated in a way that was not necessarily very respectful. And I think she people saw in her how they feel they've been treated over the last at least six years under the old premier. So Linda, fine, she was accused of being a plant. It can be a plant. If it were a plant, I'm not sure why I would, you know. Senator North Vancouver. Yeah, the handout makes no better. And I'm not sure why I would take pictures of an allegation that seems to come pretty quickly from our current government. Uh, accusations that are unfounded, that are exaggerated, that are reckless. And we saw it with we saw it with the Premier's allegation that maybe she hacked the website and she got the picture of the correct. She's actually independent. Uh, rep, independent MLA Vicky Hunter, and she just looked on the website. There was no hacking involved, but um, fast and loose with accusations is not very helpful, and sometimes can have tragic consequences, including when government made the allegations that uh, uh, health researchers, his health researchers, were um, a breach of privacy rules, and tragic consequences like And uh, Robert Kataya, he says he took his life. And we all know his sister, uh, Linda Pinkett, was so instrumental in ensuring that he had the truth was told. Open here? And when you have to fight to get the truth out, too, when the government tries to suppress it, tries to deflect responsibility, I don't consider yeah. that responsible. So I know we're working on sound issues here. Yeah, we are. Well, let's so just, uh, thank you, Nick. Um, let's just uh, switch gears now and go to another question okay. from okay. Shelley. Uh, Shelley uh, wants to know if the NDP will put the BC Ferry back under government control and do away with the sham private company that is currently BC Ferry. Thanks, okay. yeah, Shelley. Um, the NDP commitment is to say we don't like the system as it exists right now. We need to know the details of and of the current financial situation. And the responsible thing to do would be look into that deeply and carefully and systematically to ensure that whatever. 
whatever we do, we'll have better public oversight and better public involvement in the ferry system. How that would look, possibly with the ministry, possibly with the town corporation, possibly with the change to the Coastal Ferries Act, which I think is a big problem underlying all of this. We've made a commitment to reduce ferry fares by 15% on all the routes except for the major routes. So the four routes on the Sunshine Coast, Power River Cascadia, uh, Power River Coma, Pearl Coast Dolphin Bay, and Landale to uh, Pussy Bay, those will be part of those 15% reduction. As well, we're going to restore the senior GTA discount, which I think has had a negative impact, but the, the government's um, elimination of those uh, discounts has had a negative impact on, on seniors. So, those are the commitments. There are steps that need to continue to be taken. There's no way that I would suggest that this is all we're going to do. We're going to do a lot more than, uh, than that. And when we're in government, we'll have a good sense of uh, what we can do within our financial constraints. We have to remember that it's it takes a while to recover from a government that's really been neglectful of our public transportation infrastructure. And that goes for roads, that goes for ferries, that goes for all, all forms of transportation. So we're investing in transit as well, we're investing in, in some uh, highway improvements, and we're going to need to do a lot. And luckily, jobs will come from that. Uh, people working in our communities, not just in, in work camps, not just in remote areas, but in our communities around the province. We're going to see investment in infrastructure, building infrastructure, uh, retrofit buildings, energy efficiency being a focus, and I know I'm off topic, but yes, we will be looking very carefully at the uh, current system. Nothing is, no issue is raised more often than the issue of ferries. And Yes, I have been, the government knows the problem, they've been told the problem, not just by me, by very advisory committees, by regional districts, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so if you're just joining us, we are here with a live Q&A with uh, BC MP, Power River Sunshine Coast candidate Nicholas Simons. Um, we are broadcasting, uh, niche casting from the sound at the Art Center in Seashock. Uh, Nick is here until 8 o'clock. We have had some audio problems. We apologize if uh, it's been frustrating for you to, to, uh, to uh, be with us, but uh, we are still efforting on that, I think. I think we're, maybe we're okay. I think it was fine the whole time. Really? It's just what I was hearing over there. Well, I think so, actually. But we're good. We're good. Okay. We should be good. Terrific. So, um, the Greens. I think we're going to have quite a few questions about the Greens tonight, but here's one from uh, from Valerie wondering uh, why uh, the Greens and the NDP don't join forces to beat Christy Clark. Now that's something that was uh, contemplated for the federal liberal and NDP. Uh, you know, it seemed like nothing would defeat Stephen Harper. But indeed, one party did come along and defeat Stephen Harper. But it's a little late in the game this time for any such merger. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. It's almost like, well, there are different, they're not like major and huge difference in value, but there are some significant ones that would tend to say we're different parties. We have different focuses. Our, the NDP has incorporated a number of environmental policies and has you know, been actually, I think, progressive in their environmental platform in this particular in this campaign, uh, you know, those are, those are decisions that you know, parties make or, or decide to make or not make. We, I get along very well with uh, people in the Green Party, and Andrew Weaver and I stick pretty close together. And we've actually talked about it, but uh, there seems to be no appetite at this point that you know the NDP has you know been receiving you know significantly higher percentage of the vote. Um, we, we have people in our party who are you know, supported by the Green Party to run for those. So there, there are similarities, there are closenesses, there's closeness. Uh, my hope is that 
with our promise to promote proportional representation, that this isn't a question we're going to have to ask every election. And I sincerely hope that we have a system that can uh, adequately reflect people's wishes you know, in a proportional way. Because right now, I, I, I agree, the first half of the system is, is outdated. Yes, well, that does lead us to, to another question about proportional representation. This is from Gail Nielsen, uh, who we all know here on the Sunshine Coast. Um, I am very interested in proportional representation as a way of increasing democracy in our country and also in our province. Can you tell me what steps an NDP government would take in regards to improving democracy in BC? Well, improving democracy may start with the voting system, the proportional representation system that we will be promoting. The NDP will be on the side of yes, we want proportional representation. But democracy also, uh, the democratic reform also includes how we do things in the legislature. And right now there are a number of committees that are set up in order to discuss specific issues. Uh, and currently the only two committees, or mostly the only two committees that ever meet are the Child and Youth Committee, which I've been a member of for many years, and the Finance Committee which tours the province every time the government comes out of the budget. There are also Aboriginal Affairs Committee, Fisheries Committee, uh, Education Committee. Those committees very rarely sit. I've been in the Aboriginal Affairs Committee for eight years, and we have not sat once. So using the committee system better in our parliamentary system allows the parties to come together. Independent, green, liberal, NDP, together to discuss issues in a non-partisan way, or in a bipartisan way. There'll be different opinions, but in order to make better public policy. It might be a little boring, but it's, it's important. Our democratic system, we need to get big money out of politics. We need to restore people's confidence in the system that we have. And that will require a number of different uh, steps. Okay, well, we're gonna press this issue a little bit. Sure. Kathy writes, Nick, I vote green. I don't want to see the Liberals get in. If the NDP promised me, unlike Trudeau, that I could vote with my heart in BC after the next election and beyond, I and many Greens would vote NDP. I know the NDP supports proportional rep, or at least democratic reform, at least asking the question, but I don't hear it from you and your colleagues on the campaign trail. Well, How can we convince Horgan, John Horgan, that he should talk about proportional rep in this last week of campaigning? Uh, that's a fair question. And to be, to be fair, to be fair, there have been eight all candidates meetings. The issue has come up in, I'd say, at least half of them. I try to emphasize that, you know, people should feel comfortable with how they vote. And I don't, you know, I know how there is a controversy around people talking about vote splitting and people voting with their heart. And, you know, my, my strategy for my vote will be to get Christy out. That's a strategy. It's also my strategy to vote for the strongest person to represent me. And I hope that's me. However, John did talk about proportional representation, I believe, yesterday. I saw a report about it, about promising a referendum within the first two years of our mandate. How that plays out, and what form of proportional representation we would choose, I think needs to be discussed. We need to have that discussion. So, yeah, I understand how people have been burnt by the federal Liberal Party. And I know I, on the doorstep, you know, I'm finding a lot of positive responses. People do bring up the issue of the federal government changing their mind and just delaying any implementation of that proposal. But uh, there is a commitment. My colleagues and I are, are entirely in favor of ensuring that people's votes count for the people that they want to elect. And we have to have a system that reflects that. So we'll have a referendum, and the NDP has stated clearly that they'll be on the side of the yes for proportional representation. And there are lessons to be learned from the federal experience, eh? because it was in the discussion stage where it all fell apart. And it was, 
I think the, the committee that uh, the Liberals formed, uh, they, tr they, they tried to do that in a proportional way, and that was part of the problem. Yeah, there, and, and then the delays resulted in the conclusion that nothing could be changed by the next election. And I don't want to make promises I can't keep, but I would, I would be pushing this, and I, I know you'll be pushing this, uh, because I believe that the legitimate concerns of, of people who want to have an emphasis on you know, a different emphasis. I think our party platform is good. I really do. I think it's good in how it addresses social issues, how it addresses the economy, energy issues, and the environment. And so I hope this the decision to ensure that Christie Clark is not reelected um, is one that people are comfortable in the ballot uh, at the ballot box. Thank you, Nick. Okay, now a former Gibson's counselor and longtime housing activist Leanne Johnson has a couple of questions for us. Um, now, this is a bit of a preamble. How do you expect to solve the problems resulting from the current government's defunding or service mode shifting for legal services? I'm wondering in particular uh, about services such as the residential tenancy branch only providing phone in service, which could take months to become irrelevant after a tenant is booted or a rental home is wrecked and the parties involved have little opportunity to get clarifications of their legal rights in advance of a three-way phone call. Right. Well, this is, this is a problem that has been developed over a number of years. This is not a, 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 a suddenly an issue that is, it, it's been something that's been building up. Put it that way. Uh, we've seen the defunding of our legal services branch, uh, court services branch. We will be reinvesting to ensure that there are okay, enough sheriffs and enough legal aid to cover our communities. There, this is an important, this is a pillar of democracy, access to legal aid, access to the justice system. And I'm concerned in all of the sort of the, the quasi-judicial areas, like the residential tenancy branch, um, my hope and my commitment is that we will we take this issue seriously. We know the impact and the, the ramifications for having for underfunding this area. I have dealt with and helped a lot of citizens and actually landlords and tenants around this because there is when you weaken the system, it hurts everybody involved in that system with delays, with complicated uh, appeals processes. And a lack of uh, responses that are timely. Things drag on forever. So we will be reinvesting this in the in the in legal aid. We'll be reinvesting in uh, in the tribunals that support other quasi-judicial uh, um, tribunals. One good place to start, uh, Leanne suggests, is uh, that she characterizes it as the theft of lawyer fees collected for legal aid that the government took and put into general revenue. That was a 7% tax on legal services. That was, I believe, agreed to because it was going to be earmarked for supporting legal aid. And we've seen since that happened, and I believe the NDP brought that in, it was the money was diverted from specific uh, legal aid services and into general revenue, and that has resulted in a uh, lack of adequate support for our citizens. Okay, now we have had a suggestion from a listener that we switch mics. Really? Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is what we're going to this, not good. Too no, much this, is what, this is what we're going to do. We're going to move this a little closer to there, and I think we're going to hear you better. I don't know why. Really? <laughs> That's what we're doing. All right. Okay, so uh, yeah, people have been it's able time. to hear you. It just hasn't been that as clear, and I it's apologize to, to everybody out there. I can hear it in there. Not even. Another audio uh, tweak here. We really hope that uh, it helps make your experience better. I apologize for you. Well, I'm glad that they're, they're, they're yeah, people are interested in this. Well, we all our, don't have any shortage of questions. Well, all our all candidates' meetings were really well, um, were, were entirely well attended, I should say. 
So you can do that hands free now, Nicholas. I can really. How's that? Here's hoping because we're just coming off the microphone here. Okay. I can see a little line going when I'm talking. And is my mic okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. People say your mic is okay out there. It well, might be I'm picking I'm up a mess, but we're not sure why. I'm not using Nick's old mic, however. So, All right, Rick. So let us know one. if uh, you can't hear me. I know you want to hear Nick, but you all want to hear the questions too. And uh, so if you're just joining us, we are here with the live Q&A with uh, Nicholas Simons, BC NDP candidate for Powell River Sunshine Coast uh, in the May 9th provincial election. Okay, so it's closer to this. So it's closer to this. For some reason, it's just the computer that's picking it up. So I'm just going to get you to sit close. All right. Okay, we're just going to move Nick a little closer to the No, no, uh, just when you ask the question, if you just get a little closer. Oh, me too. I think it's just okay. picking up on this. So you can use the microphone as well. Okay. Thanks, just... everybody, for your patience. I'm enjoying this. I think this yeah, is I'm gonna. Good. I'm just going to get on the camera here. Okay. So okay. You're uh, in camera, Rick. Oh, you don't yeah. want to be in camera. Okay. I mean, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, a question from Chris August. Oh, Chris. Yeah, yes. I, I saw that question a little earlier. Yeah. Like, how is, this is a little uh, technical. How is the NDP going to change the forestry sector in regards to First Nations people? Chris. Uh, we've been forced to accept three to five percent in regards to revenue sharing and allowable cut, allowable annual cut. Is the NDP going to start truly sharing with First Nation people? Well, I think Chris, your question actually speaks to uh, a serious concern that I have about how government has approached discussions with First Nations communities, uh, nations, uh, and I. When you talk about being forced to accept. I need to know what that means. I think ultimately a lot of these discussions are around negotiations and the current government, you know, has not, in my view, been exactly forthright in how it addresses the, the issues that have been settled in the court. And so we need to make sure that the relationship, the discussions take place in a way that no party is feeling like there's um, that we would use the word force. If we're negotiating economic agreements, we need to be making sure that we're addressing the needs of communities, both sides, specifically around forestry, obviously, the resource industry, the traditional territory, all that plays in to how we how we come to agreements. And you know, I can just say for sure that our approach with First Nations historically has always been one that is based on respect and based on good dialogue. And I'm just hoping that when the right people are in the room, the results of discussions and negotiations isn't one where one party is going away thinking that they've been coerced or forced into any particular resolution. So I know that doesn't really answer your question completely, but it's partly about approach, partly about attitude. And uh, I think that you'll have a government after May 9th that knows how to have the frank discussions without, you know, without the idea that any, any party is being in any way coerced. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Next question, I, I believe, is from Allison. Um, this is uh, this is a whole area of government that is uh, really close to your heart. We all know. Um, let's start with a, a broad question. There, there are a few uh, supplementaries. Um, will the NDP be looking at revamping the policy and structure of the minister ministry for children and families? Well, hmm. it's a big ministry. It's a ministry that. Uh, it's so important to families, communities, and my, my hope is that the ministry will be seen ultimately as one what, that provides supports to families that are undergoing crises or undergoing challenges. I wish that our, the Ministry for Children and Families wasn't based on confrontation, conflict, uh, and fear. I think we need to have a system, if we're going to support families, that not only is the best interest of the child uh, number one, which it always has to be, but we have to we have to actually back that up by ensuring that 
we support families. We support families to be obviously the best place for children. And when and only when it's impossible to support family, like if, if the situation is so uh, problematic that children have to live somewhere else, that uh, we see it from the perspective of the child. Now, not everything is going to be in our platform, how we do some of the reforms within the Ministry for Children and Families. We, we need to make sure that uh, we do so carefully. We've seen changes happening in the ministry in the past that have had absolutely terrible ramifications for families and for children. And we want to not repeat those kind of mistakes. Those mistakes were preventable. And putting the interest of the child first is a, obviously a priority. And it can't just be words. There has to be action. And I've seen too many cases, unfortunately, where overworked social workers documented that their inability to access all the possible supports to the family have resulted in really bad outcomes for children, including children who are placed into adoption, adoptive homes without proper pre-placement visits, uh, children not being given an opportunity to live with extended family, children who have been in care for a length of time uh, and who have been, are moved to another placement without adequate post-move visits. All of these have a huge impact on the well-being of a child. So everything from ensuring children are well protected to providing the supports they need, mental health supports, counseling supports, and supports to their families, that all has to be part of how we revamp and restore strengths to the ministry. Because ultimately it's a ministry that looks after the vulnerable children in our society and uh, I think that's a fundamental, important part of our government. You know, I, I've attended seven of the eight all candidates meetings, um, and I must say, uh, occasionally uh, you get a little riled. Oh, me? <laughs> a little, yes. Uh, passion uh, uh, rises. Um, uh, anger. Basically, you're 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 pissed. Don't say bit. anything about angry because we don't. Well, want no. Anger. Well, I mean, I, this is what I'm getting to. Yeah. Is, is I mean, we're we're telling. Temper. We're seeing from the questions. Yeah. We're seeing from. Uh, you know the the extent of the of the need that is felt out there in so many different areas. Uh, you know John Horgan. He's been he's been um, you know he's been along with a few other people had a little bit of character uh, attacks on him. Um, he's a passionate guy. Yeah, he is. A, he is a passionate, and that's a good thing. You know, John has has he had, yeah sure, but he's a he's a funny guy. He's sure, he's sure of himself. He, you can talk to him, though. It's like he, it, people talk about temper. You know, we have temperament. You know, musicians are often accused of you know, having a temper. You know, I've met, I've met a lot of musicians. This isn't something to fear. It's not going to result in you know, uh, any negative ramifications. We can always talk about issues. John and I have gotten along since I met him. We've had a few arguments. We've had a few disputes. But... You know, ultimately, we both are on the same side of the ice, and we're working for the same goals. I think a lot of people are angry. I mean, I, I think it's not misplaced. No, that's um, right. you know, I, it's if it's directed and you know cr used creatively. Absolutely, absolutely. You need it for the energy to get things done a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. We're motivated by a desire to see things better, and for our province and. It's because we see things that aren't that good for a lot of people. And that, you know, when you when you knock on the door of somebody's house and they're in tears because they don't know if they have a job in two years because the government's privatizing the service they offer, you know, you could get angry. Or if you, you know, so many examples. If you, if you meet with young people who are, you know, sharing six people to a basement suite because housing prices are unaffordable, and they're paying interest on their student loans. I mean, it just, why wouldn't you? Like, what are we doing to encourage young people to pursue post-secondary education, whether it's in the trades or it's in university? We need to be doing what we can to ensure, you know, young people have the tools they need to not just survive, but to thrive in our, as the economy changes and transitions. Thank you. Now, another uh, reference to John Horgan here. Um, I don't know if this is accurate in terms of a quote, but uh, this, uh, oh, Michelle Sikora. Uh, we know well, John Horgan recently stated cannabis should be sold in liquor stores. Mm. 
What about craft producers? Will they be allowed? Well, yeah, I think this is a discussion that we have not had a you know adequate time to, to, to talk about because I think, Michelle, that the federal government came out with their uh, proposed legislation on April 11th, which I think was the day the rip dropped. Yes. So um, I agree. I, I don't think that liquor stores are the answer. It may be part of the answer, maybe part of the solution to how the distribution takes place, but I also think the province should be fighting for more authority over uh, production as well. Like the federal government sort of decided that they would be in charge of that. Uh, and I think that the province should, our provinces should all have the ability to, to uh, be more involved in that licensing and production, not just distribution. We have to discuss age, the age of uh, legal age to consume or to purchase and consume uh, marijuana. Uh, so these discussions have to take place. I totally agree. People talk to me about, oh, why wouldn't you want to be able to, to purchase uh, your marijuana at a farmer's market? You know, I mean, we, we have we have the big, big uh, agriculture industry, we have big um, meat producers and large farms, and we have small producers, and we have small farms, and we have craft and local industries that need to be promoted. And so my, my concern is that we don't, uh, we don't, uh, we support rural communities that, where the benefits of legalization can be felt, where the economies can be helped uh, through the legalized uh, production and distribution of marijuana. Obviously, in saying that, people are saying, well, health and safety are number one. Absolutely, health and safety are always going to be paramount. Um, but we have to get rid of this fear. We have to get rid of the stigma. I know lots of seniors who use medic medicinal marijuana for ailments. Um, and recreationally, it's enjoyed by a lot of people who are not uh, criminals. I mean, it's about time we legalize, but we should be doing it in a way where as much as possible, provinces and local government have a significant say over that. And really, I mean, there's just a host of complexities around this, aren't there? And we, you only have about a year to deal with it. It's a tight timeline, but you know, everything from uh, making sure that uh, when we test for, for uh, impairment, we're not using tests that aren't scientifically valid. We have to make sure that we don't arbitrarily choose a measurement system that doesn't really reflect impairment. So there are a lot of answers that we need to get to before we, um, before we decide on one system over another. So to answer the other questions, maybe liquor stores, uh, small dispensaries, you know, local companies, as much as possible, we try to make sure that the economic benefits uh, are accrued by our communities. I see a, a wrinkle I see as well. I mean, and this is this is minor, but even such things as landlord-tenant relationships. When if you're allowed to grow four plants, mm -hmm. as the uh, proposed federal legislation, I think, I mean, how do landlords and tenants uh, sort that that sort of thing out? Are you gonna be able to grow them on your balcony? I mean, these are, I know th th this is this is drilling down a little too deeply for 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 this general discussion, and, right. but it just is a it, there's so many different nuances to this. I'm looking issue. forward to that discussion. It's going to have to happen, and uh, good public policy comes from proper consultation and discussion, not from anyone imposing things on communities. And uh, that nowhere is that more apt than in this particular discussion. So, so thanks for the question, Michelle. Uh, okay, so um, here's a question. I'm concerned about environmental issues, and I'm not sure who to vote for. Mm. Are NDP's policies on the environment really better? Well, I think I think they are. Well, they're far better than the current government. You're not going to get a government that's interested in you know protecting our environment. We've seen the record of the current government. I think we're going to the uh, we're doing a lot in this in this platform. Sorry, um, on reducing carbon emissions, uh, focusing on energy savings, on retrofitting buildings in order to maximize our, our savings. Uh, it's tied into a lot of different um, different parts of our platform. So 
we talk a lot about ensuring that public buildings uh, get the retrofits that are necessary to reduce uh, our consumption of fossil fuels. We are you know, dead set against Site C as a, as a project that will not only cause problems in the First Nations relationships, but also alienate land from future food production possibilities. That's an environmental issue as well. We will be setting targets for our carbon emissions that are sped up from this current government's uh, plans, which are unfortunately we're going in the wrong direction. And I think, well, when you see prominent environmentalists saying that our, our uh, environmental platform is solid and achievable and manageable, um, I feel confident that people who are concerned about the environment have a party they can feel comfortable in, in the New Democrats. Uh, we have not always done everything perfectly, and I think it's good when you see parties evolve. The New Democrats have evolved. We originally were against, or we were in favor of cap and trade as our method of pricing carbon, and we recognize that our, our carbon tax is is progressive, but we need to ensure that it remains progressive. The federal government has established uh, new targets, which we will try to achieve um, in, a, in a graduated way. We will achieve in a graduated way. Uh, so I think, I think people who are concerned about the environment, concerned about tanker traffic, concerned about the expansion of the oil sands, will find comfort in the fact that the New Democrats in British Columbia take that issue very seriously. Now, Kinder Morgan, uh, John Morgan, the NDP, are, are dead set against uh, Kinder Morgan, but what can you do? I mean, you get into office on, uh, you know, you start looking around on May 10th and think, okay, um, <laughs> Kinder Morgan's been basically approved by other levels of government, previous government. What can you really do to stop it? Right. Well, I can just say what John Horgan has said, and that we will use every tool in our toolbox to uh, to stop Kinder Morgan. That's what he said quite clearly. We we do not accept this increase in tanker traffic. We do not accept uh, that there is our we we have we have no capacity really to respond to any concern about oil spill. We need to uh, emphasize this that even the smallest spills seem to cause huge problems because of our capacity. And there may be some increase in our capacity to respond, but the Kinder Morgan pipeline project is one that the New Democrats categor categorically uh, are against. Thanks, Nick. So uh, earlier um, we had audio problems and we apologize for that. And I think uh, I have good reason to believe that, uh, that we're good now but there's a very important question asked earlier, oh. and I think uh, we've, we've been made aware that it wasn't heard, and that oh. was to do with proportional reps. So let me just repeat the question, if I may. Um, I don't want to see the Liberals get in. If the NDP promised me that I could vote with my heart in BC after the next election and beyond, I and many Greens would vote NDP. I know the NDP supports proportional rep, but I don't hear it from you and your colleagues on the campaign trail quite enough. Yeah, I... I um and my answer before was that we've had eight all candidates meetings and it's come up about four or five times, mm -hmm. four times, I think. And uh, I've said quite clearly that our position is that we will hold a referendum within two years and the New Democrat caucus, which is unanimous on this, will be supporting the yes side for proportional representation. Now, that puts us two years into the mandate and we need to figure out what will it, we're able to do, what system we would use in the next election. I think that's the goal. I mean, this is something that we want to value every vote. I think it's, democracy is more important than partisan politics. Democracy is more important than, than, than party politics. And so in order for people to have some trust in government, in our democratic system, people need to know that 
their vote counts. And I, I, I understand that, that frustration that, that, uh, that many in the third party, as they are now, are uh, feel because they, you know, they saw the federal government basically say one thing and then do something completely different. But I heard John Horgan say yesterday that, yes, we're going to be holding a referendum. That referendum will be whether or not British Columbia should go to a proportional representation system. The New Democrats will be supporting that option, and I'm comfortable with that. I think that uh, our system needs to be one that people have confidence in. And I also, I think I pointed out in response to that question, that democratic reform also includes a number of other initiatives, including getting big money, big corporate money out of politics, and as well union money out of politics. We need another system. And the Liberals don't like this because they, and so of course they respond with a number of, you know, made up stories, which is really par for the course. But we will find a system with the expertise of respected experts in our communities to find, you know, the best possible solution for, for our voting system. This really is, I mean, big money was a, uh, um, a big issue for uh, the NDP at the beginning of the election. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's petered out a little bit just in terms of a campaign theme because new things come up, so yeah. many more things to talk about. But this really is a big money, little money kind of election, is it not? I mean, this well, is... Well, you know, the election started early with uh, the, the ruling party had a lot more money. They, they've been in power for 16 years. Many people think that they have a lot of money because they, you know, gave a lot of favors. Um, so we, you know, the New Democrats were in a bit of a, you know, less fortunate position. But, you know, when we see that the New Democrats get most of their contributions from individuals, we see that there's a bit of a, a, dis, a disparity in, in, in that system. Yeah, we, we, uh, we need to do what we can to restore confidence and in our, in our system of, of governance. And when big money looks like it's influencing policy, and when it looks like it's uh, affecting, you know, government decisions, it's not a good thing. You know, I remind people that the New Democrats have not uh, passed a piece of legislation or issued a permit or a license in the last 16 years. And, you know, our, our connection with, with unions is that we have always supported workers, workers who are represented by unions and workers who are not represented by, by unions. And, you know, I don't see a problem with supporting policies that protect workers from dangerous working conditions or allow them to have leave when medical circumstances arise or personal circumstances arise. So this is all, you know, I don't see a direct, there's corporate funding and union donations are not necessarily on par, but we want to get big money out of politics. Now, uh, you would have legislation pretty much ready, would you not? I mean, this could be one of the first things that an NDP government would do. Yeah, this is something that Gary Holman, and uh, MLA, who's, who's very, very concerned and very interested in democratic reform has been pushing, as well other issues of democratic reform, which have been put forward as private members bills in the legislature. They haven't been approved or accepted by the government, so they haven't been debated. But uh, a number of important initiatives to restore people's faith in our democratic system would be necessary. And, and I think taking big money out of politics would be one of the first things we did. We're getting more questions coming. We are getting more questions. Some on, on education, which we talked about last night yeah, at the sure. last All Candidates meeting. Uh, I should point out that if people want to read the platform, it's available online at bcndp.ca. And uh, it's 128 pages or so, and uh, it's actually an interesting read. Take your time with it. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I haven't memorized it, but I think I know most of it. Uh, Christy Clark on teachers. Uh, Christy Clark fought with teachers for a long time. Uh, she seems to really hate them, and although the Green platform in education is pretty good, Andrew Weaver seems to share Christy Clark's disdain for teachers, as he showed recently to members of the Greater Victoria Teachers Association when they met with him. 
What is your experience with public school teachers and how would an NDP government treat teachers differently? Oh, you know, I, I, I saw that, I, I saw that interaction, or I, I saw the, the, the description of the interaction between Ms. Do Professor Weaver and the teachers, and it seemed to be more of a personal thing, which didn't reflect well. But what we really need to do is, you know, obviously the New Democrats have, have uh, traditionally been very, very supportive of public education as uh, an important equalizer in our society, and public education needs to be adequately funded. And when you have a government on one hand that is fighting against that proper funding for 16 years, um, I think it's time we had a government in power that uh, respected teachers and the work that they did, they do. And I've, I've only heard stories from John Horgan about how the public education system saved him from uh, potentially going in the wrong direction in life. And, you know, we have to, you know, hold our hands up for the, for the teachers who take that time and who have over the past 16 years while the government has hollowed out their ability to, to be, you know, to do what they needed to do. That despite that, our teachers have been doing a, you know, amazing job. Um, and, you know, when you, when you hear disdain, broad sweeps of criticism about teachers and what they do or don't do, I don't think that's necessarily reflective of the community, of our society. We have an important public education system that needs to be supported more than it is. And uh, its successes over the last 16 years have been because of the teachers and despite of the government. I think we only have time for one more question, Nick. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we should do this more often. We should. I mean, there have been so many good questions, and we really apologize for uh, for the delay in getting the audio quite right. It's a complicated process. Um, uh, but let me just we sure. only have about another ninety seconds for this uh, for this question. It's very important. Does the uh, NDP have a plan to address the fentanyl crisis, especially in rural centers? Well, this is this is important. You know, as a former social worker, I, I've met with families, that, mums, who have lost their sons to fentanyl uh, overdoses. And that is why I was reassured that when our party took this seriously and showed that in our platform by the establishment, our planned establishment of a ministry for mental health and addictions. So too often, we... People are marginalized, and we don't address fundamental addiction issues early enough. So a standalone mental health and addictions ministry is essential. Early intervention in our school system, access to mental health at a young age is, is important and essential, and we're committed to that as well within our school system. When we see children in distress early, we can do preventative work and ensure that those problems don't become worse. And so a healthy community, a healthy society is, what are you doing there? No, I'm just taking a picture of this. I'm oh, sorry. No, I'm that's sorry. all right. You just <laughs> it's I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Uh, oh, cameras everywhere. But uh, I really appreciate that question. Our rural centers, yes, um, this is a problem that we face in all our communities. And we need to be able to, you know, low barrier, no shame admission to detox when it's needed. Uh, proper follow-up treatment, proper recovery houses that are that are licensed and meet standards that we expect in our communities. It'll be a big change from our current government's approach, that's for sure. Okay, we are going to, uh, we, everybody's nodding about asking one more question. Okay. We're going to go a little past 8 o'clock. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us. Um, the Liberals say that they will create and have created a lot of jobs for BC residents. I haven't heard Mr. Horgan mention jobs quite as much as they have. What is the NDP approach to job creation? Well, obviously, we need to create the conditions in which jobs can thrive. And, you know, we don't talk about jobs as if it's just a slogan or a headline. It's jobs are important, obviously, for our economy. And we plan to create jobs through investment and infrastructure in our province. Probably the largest uh, refit program in BC history. I would, from my estimation, and that is uh, establishing jobs that um, across our province, investing in our communities in, in the in the 
retrofit of public buildings. Uh, 97,000 jobs are projected to be, to be uh, created in our communities. And those are construction jobs, those are jobs that build our communities for the future. Um, we've seen stagnation in job growth. We've seen an increase in the number of part-time jobs, low-wage jobs. Those are not the kind of jobs. We want to have living wage jobs, jobs that people in our communities are able to uh, take on that allow them to pay the rent or buy a house or provide for their families. And those jobs are clearly described in our platform. And uh, I think this is, this is essential that we, we have the conditions in our communities. You know, even this is related to childcare, a $10 a day childcare, increase in the number of people working in that green industry, um, providing care for children so parents can work. Um, this is a complicated question that doesn't, that deserves more than slogans. So I leave it to the, to the current government to, to try to confuse people and I look forward to a better government that will actually provide jobs, allow for jobs to exist um, in all our communities. And so I, I just sort of, I, I would suggest, you know, our platform is a good platform, it's comprehensive, it's one that I feel confident about that will convince people that this is a chance for, for a better British Columbia. Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Oh, I've had fun. This is, uh, we've been coming to you uh, in this live stream Q&A from The Sound at the Art Centre in Seashell. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Apologies for the earlier problems. Thanks to uh, producers uh, Michelle Morton and Kara Atkinson and Steve Weave. Uh, and to you, Nicholas Simons, BC right. NDP candidate for Powell River Sunshine Coast. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Well, you've been well rehearsed. Well, my, my job's bad. I know what I'm going to ask him.